Welcome to today's edition of the CIO Wars Cooler. My name's David Savage. Thank you for joining us for this conversation where we're talking to Milan User, the global CIO at TUI. How are you this morning? I'm all right, David. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Before we get into anything else, I'm, I'm sure most people will be familiar with TUI, but it'd be great to get a quick explanation from yourself about the business and about your role there. Absolutely. So uh, TUI is the world's largest integrated travel business. Um, so obviously going through a, a massive revival post-COVID uh, has been a tremendously interesting journey for us. Um, we operate um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different destinations globally. Um, we have our own airline, we have our own hotels, we have our own cruise business, you, know, you, you name it, we have it. Uh, but at the same time, from a technology point of view, we have a vast uh, technology estate uh, which we might, might come on to in, in a moment, uh, and really cover everything to do with creating amazing experiences for, for customers. About 27 million customers um, every, every year travel with us globally. Um, so I think we have a f fairly interesting footprint. Absolutely. And I have the impression from my own business travels that people are just itching to get back out into the world at the moment. I think that's spot on. I think you know, lots of people, of course, are very, very keen to get out there, especially as the weather is getting worse, people want to travel. Uh, it's been a very difficult period for many. People couldn't travel because of COVID or other restrictions in various countries. So we're quite excited about the uh, what the future is going to bring. And we certainly see more demand coming through the, the pipeline and customers keen to, to kind of start traveling again, both you know in, in Europe, but also long haul. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, the, the conversation is going to centre around a lot of the, the dynamics around recruiting, retaining, motivating remote and hybrid teams. I suppose to set some context, how much has the landscape changed in terms of your team, both pre and post pandemic, if you look at where they are and how hybrid you are, because I, I suppose it would be good to get an understanding of that before we really dive into some of those yeah, topics. Yeah, excellent context. So very much so is, is the short answer. Um, TUI before pandemic uh, was very much concentrated on working mostly within in offices with a little bit of home working every now and then, but very much an office-based kind of environment. And of course, the, the pandemic changed it for us as it did for many other businesses. So where we are now is my team has been spread, spread across about 13 different countries. Um, I've hired some of the best talent actually remotely um, and uh, many of them I had a chance to meet them only six, eight, nine months after they actually started with us. Uh, so it's been it's been a very transformational journey for TUI but it also meant that we could start engaging colleagues and, and new people and new talent from regions that we haven't really considered before. Um, so it gives us the opportunity to tap into you know, new talent pools and, and, and amazing um, technology that may not be available in the UK or in Germany, but actually is um, readily available in other countries, be it nearshore or offshore. So very fundamental change. And to be honest, I think this is this is the way how things are going to pan out going future, in the future as well. Now, look, you're, you're describing there, and wonderfully so, some of the positives new regions, new talent pools as a consequence, new technology not available in the UK and Germany. But there will be obviously some challenges uh, involved in that. So when it comes to those challenges around recruiting and retaining remote and hybrid teams, what, what are the ones that have appeared that you've had to work through? Yeah, you're right. And there has been a range of new things we had to get really good at and, and still learning how to do that well. So I guess in terms of recruitment, it really starts with identifying what skills and what at what level we need, um, and then exploring where we find the talent. And today, as I said, we can recruit more globally, but some skills are readily available in some regions or some countries than others. And of course, things like time zones also come into consideration here. And then, of course, many in many instances, we, we have to work with partners who help us find the talent in a given location or a given region. And that also means that we have to be very clear about what we need, uh, what is the culture we're looking for, what is the collaboration, we, uh, what are the skills, what is the technology, but also what is the sort of cultural and um, uh, a fit from a, from a sort of chemistry point of view. So establishing that uh, really takes quite some time. And we found that it takes several months before we sort of calibrate each other's expectations and can establish this sort of pipeline of talent going into the business. It's interesting that you talk about chemistry 
Because chemistry is one of those things that is is quite intangible and is is okay. born, I suppose, out of meeting people. We were lucky enough to bump into each other in Lisbon last week. You had your team in Lisbon, and I got the impression from your social post that was as much actually about being together as a team as it was learning from the talks that were there. Yeah, and and it, you're, you're spot on. And the chemistry is really hard to establish remotely, isn't it? Especially if all you see is a 2D image of someone on, on a screen. So um, what we try to do is to really concentrate on uh, asking the right questions when, when interviewing people and looking for examples and putting them in situations where they can naturally sort of collaborate with um, some of our other colleagues and kind of observe how they how they manage themselves and how they connect with others. But especially when it comes to then bringing sort of people in and trying to bring connect them with the rest of the business, a lot of it is about having sort of idea of um, shared ownership. Uh, understanding what uh, culture, what, what the cultural differences are, and how we actually make those cultural differences to work better for us. You know, we all know that diverse teams tend to outperform those that are not diverse, and diversity of experience, diversity of opinion, uh, really makes a big difference. So, what we're trying to do is to actually use these cultural differences as a as a booster uh, to our performance. At the same time. Um, we all know that getting it wrong could really impede uh, the way how the team, make, team makes decisions. Uh, it makes it makes uh, misunderstandings very likely, and also creates situations where people are just don't collaborate well. So the sort of the cultural fitness and and on both sides uh, and adapting to each other, huge component on how we're trying to bring the teams together. And you mentioned that where you've hired remotely, it might be six, eight or nine months before you meet some of these people. In terms of understanding what motivates them, what keeps them ticking, I suppose there might be some greater clarity around that. You have fewer touch points. It'd be really interesting to know how you do ensure that teams stay motivated when you're working on, 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 a, on a remote basis. Yeah, and so I think for me, it has almost like two, two parts. The, the, the core foundational part, I think really is the same of regardless of whether you are remote or not. It's about human motivation. It's about, is the work interesting? Am I learning something? Uh, do I like the people I work with? Um, is the culture good? Do I have time to do it, to innovate? Um, is the technology, you know, something that really moves me, uh, moves me and interests me? All these sort of foundational things, they matter to anyone, regardless of whether they are in the UK, in Germany, in Poland or in India. But then you're right, for, for remote teams, there are some additional considerations that make some of that a little bit harder. So, for instance, um, do I, if I'm a, if I'm a, uh, someone who works remotely, do I have a feeling that I genuinely own something, that my team has ownership of some uh, capability or some product or some service? Or am I really just an execution arm of the business? You know, I just fulfill the backlog rather than owning anything. How well do I feel connected to the, to the rest of the organization? Do I understand how the business runs? Do I understand the market? How often do I actually see my colleagues in person? How often do I see my line manager in person? Uh, and how well the communication works? So for us, for the remote um, teams, lots of this has been about trying to bring them as close as possible, treat them as equals, and giving them ownership and responsibility uh, so that they have their own destiny. They are they're shaping uh, the, the solutions either uh, for the business or with us so that they really see that they, uh, the work that they're doing has purpose and meaning. We obviously don't have physical offices in hybrid environments in quite the same way or at least when we do we, we come together in them on a less frequent basis and you talk about the fact that um, diversity is obviously such a strength but it also means that you've got people from a wider array of different cultural backgrounds and demographic backgrounds and I think you mentioned 13 different countries how can a team environment be built that that adequately encompasses everybody and it's if I had a perfect answer, I would, would probably write a book and, and it's, sell a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, but I think it's some of the some of the things, some of the ingredients that we found really help uh, in, in my experience, certainly is things like clarity about the ways of working. Right. If we have a hybrid model where some people come to the office, some people are remote. Uh, what are the rules of engagement? How do we make sure that the people who are remote are actually virtually present 
uh, have a space in a meeting to co contribute to the conversation, are invited to a conversation. If we are in a hybrid model where people come to the office on specific days, how do we make sure that each team has some kind of agreed principle as to when they are in, what they are trying to do in the office, and how do they get the most out of it? And then, of course, trying to maximize the, the few opportunities that we have when we are together physically to also do some fun stuff, some kind of non-work related things, be it during the day or perhaps in the evening, because those things really bond people together and create what I would refer to as sort of deeper relationships, more meaningful relationships. And we know that when you have a deeper relationship with someone, other things follow much more easily. Just out of interest, have you got any early indication as you're going through this process about how, how regularly that should take place? I suppose it, it depends on different teams, different size of environments, but for you, what's working? Yeah. Um, so I think the, the finger in the air, sort of rule of thumb guideline we try to adhere to is getting to getting those teams together physically where we can roughly once a quarter. Sometimes we can't, we don't succeed in that just because some of the teams are fairly large and flying people in from different countries could, could become logistically challenging. But I think once a quarter is, is sort of a sweet spot. It makes the balance between actually committing to the time together versus the travel and the logistics around it about right. Um, but it's really hugely context sensitive um, and depends on also what's going on in the business and how the rest of the business is operating. You talked about someone being virtually present. Let's um, let's pick up on that for a second, because I suppose there's a huge array of tools, platforms, systems that can be used to enable better workflow and communication and to allow someone to be virtually present. What tools and systems have you uh, identified so far that are helping you do that? It, we are hugely reliant on this as, as any, any business who, who operates remotely and in some sense the pandemic has really accelerated uh, the development and maturing of that sort of uh, tooling ecosystem much more so than we probably imagined so i think if i, if I look at it uh, from maybe three, two or three different lenses the first one things like a technology related tooling so how do we run our cicd pipelines and infrastructure and code repositories and so on vast majority of the modern tools are sort of natively supporting remote working and so that's usually not an issue when we talk about communication collaboration and idea sharing ideation those kinds of things this is where we find tools like uh, miro or mural very very useful you know we've we've ran sessions with you know 20 30 50 sometimes 100 people collaborating on the same board kind of co-creating either user experience or maybe ideating on a certain organizational changes or perhaps just um, running a retro. So being able to run a real-time collaboration session with some of these tools really makes, makes it possible for regardless of where you are to make equal contribution. And then I want to mention one last piece in terms of tooling. And that's really about um, how we share knowledge and how you communicate when in a remote or hybrid environment. And I'm a big believer in um, tools like Loom um, where you can have for things like webinars or uh, brown bag sessions, etc. It sort of combines the, the the raw content, the presentation of some sort, with a a, a picture or video of someone who's um, actually uh, presenting or, or giving giving uh, sharing the information. And for me, the combination of the of the video with the content itself makes it much more engaging. And it also enables once you start to build a library of these things, is to uh, for people to consume this content asynchronously so regardless of where they are whether they were in the session or not they have an opportunity to digest this content when it suits them rather than when the meeting was taking place so those kinds of tools really made a difference it's interesting you're mentioning a few different tools there and you you specifically talk about communication but you talked about the development of, of this tooling i know that one of the concerns still with a lot of organizations is around productivity perhaps and there's been question marks, I suppose, around whether some of the tooling is being used in a very traditional pre-pandemic way. It sounds like you've got some tools here that are beginning to, to break down the modes of working and present mm. a slightly different um, rhythm to the way that your teams are I working. think that's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant point to make. Um, I, I refer to this really as this as of asynchronous working and kind of accepting it for what it is. Does it mean that we should, we don't have meetings in real time together? Of course, not. we continue to speak to people. But at the same time, we're not trying to fight the fact that people might be in different time zones or that they could not attend a particular session. Instead, we're making sure that uh, the materials, uh, the videos, whatever it might be, continues to be available to them 
to consume at a later stage if that's what they prefer to do, because that's a, that basically is accepting the reality of asynchronous working without actually having to pay the price related to, oh, I missed out on the session and therefore I'm not part of the conversation. Let's let's finish on a, on a particularly broad question that I suppose if you have the answer to, again, might be a, a jump point for a book. But uh, in your opinion, what actions do you think are going to help reduce the tech uh, skill shortage that obviously so many are facing? Yeah, as you said, you know, it's a, it's a complex question, and therefore there isn't a, a simple simple answer. I mean, for for me, there is a the range of things that will make a difference and will continue to make a difference. Uh, but I, I wouldn't profess that I have I have the clear answer. But to, to give some 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 my insights, for me, it's the the solution really is is a combination of things like investment in education at secondary schools and university levels, especially in the STEM careers. You know. In the future, everything will be STEM. Ultimately, everything will be somehow technology powered. In fact, most things already are anyway. So I think growing the or the overall sort of digital awareness at secondary school and, uh, level, especially, will make a difference. It's also about things like cross-skilling programs. Uh, lots of people start, started their career doing something, but actually they might enjoy pivoting their career into you know, technology, IT, or any other related fields. So how do we make it easy through either traditional sort of in-person learning and boot camps, but also the online course platforms like Udemy or Coursera or Udacity for them to acquire new skills and to kind of pivot their career into, into IT. And I would love to see more of these programs focused on women and minorities we, we have still a challenge within tech with with diversity this would make a big difference i guess finally um it's sometimes about organizations being prepared to give people a chance especially when it comes to junior talent sometimes you need to take a pun you have to you, ha you have to be prepared to say you know what this person may not tick all the boxes but i feel there is a potential i feel that they can do really well let us bring them in and let us support them. And uh, more often than not, we found that these people really grow and prosper successfully uh, in, in the organization and move on to do great things elsewhere, perhaps at some point. So sometimes it is about giving people a chance and the opportunity to start with. Milan, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you for giving up your time. Thanks very much, David. It was a pleasure talking to you as well. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the CIO Water Cooler TV, please stick around. There are plenty more of these talks on the website for you to explore.